I welcome you to sacred space. I welcome you to one of the most visceral reminders we human beings get that there's something beyond this. As we speak about the gift of a particular life that was lived in the wine line, and how in the mystery of our faith we believe there's this greater, larger container of God's grace and much of Warren lives on in that unseen place as well as much of Warren lives on in this place and the influence and the, the things that he cared about, uh, namely some of these people sitting near the front. For the next few minutes, uh, there'll be <clears throat> song and prayer and some reflections. And it was the, uh, the wish of Warren, who had a lot of influence in this next, uh, this next hour of this service, as he thought about it a lot. We're going to move much as funerals do in New Orleans, where there is a somber awareness at the beginning. Uh, the music we're going to sing at the beginning will, will, will feel a little more somber. But uh, you better believe, by the time we walk out of here in an hour, we will be singing hallelujah and aware of all the jubilation of this life as God intends it. I'm appreciative of Doc Probe's bringing music, and I'm appreciative of this choir that, that Warren felt such an affinity with as he... Uh, as he sang with them, and I suspect there is a chair up in that choir loft with his robe draped across it this afternoon. I'll say this again uh, as we are concluding the service, but the hospitality of this church uh, is open to, um, to you and the family, especially Lois, would like all to come down and, and join them for a meal afterwards. You may remain seated during this entire service and singing and all. We're going to begin again with a somber awareness of faith as we sing 520, Nobody Knows the Trouble I See.
So life has struggle, but life also has joy, and Warren knew them both. I'd like to say for just a moment, remember some of my remembrances, you have your own, about some marks of, of Warren Lane's life that made him unique and resilient. I'm aware, as I think of Warren today, how he cared deeply about people and about ideas. Ideas that contributed to faith and contributed to the common good. And he would talk to you a long time about any of those ideas. The way I like to say it is Warren engaged thinking about his faith akin to how an engineer leans into a building project. In other words, he cared about the details. He often wanted to discuss the finer points to a sermon of mine that no parishioner in any of my congregations has ever engaged me with such conviction. Sometimes he would take me to task for how I interpreted a, a biblical passage, but all the while respectful and demonstrating his commitment to following the way of Christ. He liked to imagine the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey might say it. Whenever I had a few minutes in the hallway to talk with Warren, he always concluded our, our time together with saying, thank you for listening to me. Anyone to remember that experience? That's the way Warren was. Thank you for taking time to listen to me. He was excited in this church when a new men's group formed a few years ago. And he spoke of how important it was to him that men would support one another through life's ups and downs. Collegiality and, and, and support and kinship were important to him. I believe that Warren encouraged harmony between his neighbors. Harmony was important to Warren. I will always smile remembering Warren's life when he recounted to me how much he enjoyed going to Meyer's grocery store and just hanging out and seeing who might walk up to him in the produce section, open to a conversation. On one of those days, he told me about being near the deli section in Myers and hearing a mother very frustrated with her temper tantrum child who was in the buggy. It was not going well at all. So Warren saw fit to stroll up near the woman and kind of over his right shoulder say, are we having a bad day? <laughs> How he avoided being slapped in the face, I do not know. But that was Warren. He was willing to open a conversation, even in prickly places, in hopes of bringing a little harmony. Just this morning, as our church gathered for uh, some acts of service around the neighborhoods, uh, around our town here, a member of the team I was working with recalled how Warren was always willing to volunteer at the Safe Harbor Shelter which our church and others provide a little shelter for our neighbors experiencing homelessness in the winter. And Warren was always willing to take the night shift, which was always the hardest shift to fill. And when we, he was offered, do you just want to do a part of the night, uh, Warren? He'd say, no, give me the whole night. I'll be there if any of the guests wake up in the night and need somebody to talk to. So I can see why the gospel story he chose for today that you'll hear in a little while. The gospel story about a woman at a well that Jesus encounters and gives her dignity. I could see how that story would be meaningful to Warren since he had a passion for reaching out to others who were isolated and in need of the waters of new life. I want now to offer a few words that uh, Lois had shared better, uh, a little bit about Warren's life. Maybe you can appreciate this too. I quote from this letter. A few years ago, Warren was the speaker at an open meeting for al groups and interested people in the public. He wanted to share some of those thoughts during this last public sharing of his earthly life. In other words, Warren wanted this uh, anecdote to be shared at this gathering today. He had learned through the loving 
acceptance of the 12-step program, as well as many in his spiritual tradition, how to open up and understand his own inner dynamics. He had never felt deep down worthwhile or that anyone would want to listen to him tell about himself. He had been very forcefully taught that that would be bragging or self-centered when he grew up, as he was growing up. For many who know him, that may be hard to understand, yet as quoted in his obituary, an aunt of his noted decades ago that he was, quote, really very sentimental. You wouldn't think so just meeting him as he covered it up quite well, unquote. In fact, it took many years before Lois had an inkling of that aspect of his. The last months of his life, he had told her that he had been feeling somewhat disturbed when being visited. Please note that somewhat, as he always perked up, with visitors, especially men, being since he was surrounded mainly by women growing up, so he appreciated his men visitors. When Lois asked why he felt disturbed, he said he was a little embarrassed when anyone came to see him, even though he was grateful, because he felt teary and a little overwhelmed when someone came up to visit. He felt he had so little to offer in return anymore no longer a productive member of society. He had been taught that men don't cry, and he sometimes felt like a weakling, and he was afraid he would be overcome with emotion during one of those visits. She tried to help him by pointing out that the Mona Lisa herself, that painting, just hung on the wall, and yet was greatly valued by the museum and visitors who just came to look and study her. Needless to say, he didn't buy into Lois's analogy. Of course, these deep feelings went further back than his feeling, than his failing capabilities. He, his parents married in their early in the early 1920s. His, his mother was a member of the Evangelical Church, and his father a Roman Catholic. A priest conducted the ceremony, but not in the church, rather in one of the side rooms, perhaps the the. Uh, the manse. Neither ch changed their religious affiliation at the time. Their families highly disapproved that they were married in the first place. Warren, even as a youngster, noticed the apparent coolness sometimes in his home, and even sometimes an ostracism in the family. That was the reason that things around his home uh, made him sometimes uncomfortable. Despite being a blonde white male, that early experience of being cut off or being seen as less than sensitized him toward others who were labeled in a derogatory way. His personal experiences also provoked empathy for those who looked or thought differently, especially anyone who might be from a foreign culture. Of course, he had his own beliefs and views, but he was also open to others' views. While in the South Pacific during World War II, he became personally aware of Japanese atrocities done during the war, but also when reaching the Philippines, a similar retaliatory response to any Japanese person from those in the Philippines. Yet Warren never, in over 50 years, as Lois was around him, he never showed any bitterness toward anyone of Japanese or Asian or other descent. His subsequent study of a people so far flung from our shores, whose cultures were so foreign to our own, somewhat isolated even, and who were led to attack us, he still chose to have a broader perspective. It was partly due to an awareness of the Western world's overreach at the time he was able to see, in his own words, upon learning of his son's deployment to Vietnam, he told Lois, you know, my heart is not in this sacrifice. Along with his deep, constant study of Jesus' responses to people in the Gospels and the Al-Anon 12-step program gave him a non-judgmental way where he could express openly his feelings and thoughts. Through listening to himself and others, he, along with Lois,
and the Eleron members learned some new ways to evaluate any destructive views and responses. With a friend in Jesus, he did, at heart, find confession, even of a, a false denigration of himself, good for his soul. That would be his wish for you all today. Thank you, Lois, for those words. As we hear a, a piece of music now, again, of Warren's choosing, I want to introduce it by saying, Warren was a son of the soil, and he worked with his hands all his life, even when he became a college graduate. And he would grieve just as his father had when he could no longer work the soil.
the Gospels matter to Warren. There was life in the stories for him. And one such story about um, the compassion of the itinerant rabbi Jesus coming into a town, coming to a well, and encountering a woman there who was estranged from her community. That story resonated with Warren. So I'd like to ask uh, Elder Warner to come forward and offer those verses of scripture and a, a little commentary. Might be Warren's commentary, might be your commentary. We'll start with the commentary, and it is Warren's commentary. As some of you know, Warren was a serious lay student of the Bible. He had his brother, a United Methodist pastor, as a sounding board, along with almost every minister from whom he ever heard a sermon. His curiosity and concern for people led him to be open to the great diversity amongst humanity. And in particular, how Jesus related to this diversity. To follow Warren's thoughts, we have a letter he wrote to a religious periodical, Quaker Life, regarding portions of John chapter 4 and its telling of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. He wrote, I read with interest your editorial in the March 88 Quaker Life titled, Christ-Centered Diversity. I was in particular agreement with the statement, it's easier to point the finger of accusation at other sins, as we perceive them, than realistically deal with our own. Allow me to be diverse and disagree, or at least take this occasion to defend the woman you referred to as an outcast woman at the well. I feel that this woman has been maligned unfairly over the years. Some years ago, I came to the conclusion that scripture was not written on a negative slant at any time. This idea causes me to look at scripture with new insights. So based on the premise of the positiveness of scripture, I continue. There are a few indications that this woman was of strong emotional fiber and was respected by the town. That she was acquainted with grief and sorrow cannot be disputed. Apparently, she had followed the Jewish custom of marrying in the family and was buried. Now, if my understanding is right, then, if the last husband was the end of the family, she would have no place to go. For all I know, she could have been functioning as a live-in housekeeper to maintain a livelihood. Perhaps it was even a platonic relationship. That she was well read in scripture is known. Her discussion with Jesus was both perceptive and responsive. As far as I can determine, this lady was the first to be told that Jesus was the Messiah and certainly was the first evangelist. She did something about her contact with her Messiah and told the town. She was taking a risk. I wonder if I would have been so bold. Finally, the town of Sychar responded en masse. If this lady was not respected, I have reservations that the town would have responded so positively. In closing, then, the passage raises questions as to why discourse is seldom given to the following points. Take note, Chris. <laughs> Number one, the gender of the person addressed. Talking to the woman, was as astounding to the disciples as was the fact that she was a Samaritan. Number two, Jesus' acceptance of her forthright responses, an egalitarian discourse. Three, that she was the first evangelist. Four, that Jesus affirmed her honesty when he said, you are right. Five, that Jesus did not tell her to sin no more, which had been the case in so many circumstances. So with these insights as to Warren's thinking on the subject, let us hear the story as told by the Gospel writer. From John, 
chapter 4. The Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman from Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. When the two days were over, he went from that place to Galilee. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. And is anyone surprised that Warren from Beyond the Grave is teaching us something today? That uh, word in uh, Eldon's introduction of uh, Warren was drawn to diversity interested in people who were from another place, that perspective. Um, this next hymn was a hymn dear to him because
is at Palm Ridge University. And that our God is so great, God is not a respecter of tribe and sect, but God loves the human family. And this uh, song we're going to sing called This Is My Song. Um, we're going to sing just the first two verses of it. It's there in your hymnals, um, number 437. And uh, I think it picks up pretty clearly the honoring of diversity.
it seems proper, as we've reflected on some values of Warren, that the human relationship he invested the most in with Lois, that Lois would have an opportunity to come and share a moment of her own saying farewell. So that she didn't have any problems from her brothers. 
Then Betty Cooper would go back home. She lived across the street. The two people next door were still up, and I was expected home within an hour or so when she left. So we come home, but first we had, he didn't tell me when he came to pick me up that though his aunt could drive, they were taking a bus into the bus station in Detroit, and he, even though I was on time, and those that know me, that when I say I was out in that car when he expected me to be, he was a little antsy. And I found out it was because his aunt wasn't driving him to town. They were taking the bus to the main bus station in Detroit where he was going to pick them up. So he was, of course, eager to get there. And so we picked them up, and then afterwards we drove them home. No problem with that, a little bigger, but no problem. We get back to the house, and my daughter, of course, had been told to lock the door. She was very careful. She locked the storm doors. Now, I didn't want to break the door, so I thought, well, okay, I'll walk around, rat down windows, including the bedroom window. Now, three kids, two out, two years apart, there was hardly a time when you weren't woken up by one. Not one of those children woke up. Not at all. So I went to one of the two neighbors, they were still up. I said, will you ring the phone? They rang the phone, landline, not like the cell phones that only give you six rings for another person, which is lousy. They let it ring and ring and ring. They didn't wake up. So we walked around the house, and I found that there was a bathroom window, so we got the screen off. Now, what I haven't told you is the memento from out at Sugarville. He was in a cast from as far up as you could go down to where only his toes showed. He went back to work because he was bored, but they wouldn't let him drive a company car. I don't think his insurance company would have liked him driving. So when he came, his right leg was spread out. Fortunately, I had small feet, so there was room. So now it starts to sprinkle lightly. I have a nice little coat on, but I'm not going to, it's too much to try and crawl through the window with the coat. So imagine a man on crutches with a cast almost up to his groin, with my coat. Now, I said to myself, well, the interesting thing is that patrol comes around, I think we can give a good answer of who we are legitimately. And then later years, I was sorry that the patrol car didn't come around, <laughs> because I thought it would make a good story, and we have a paper in town that puts an issue, a column about news of the weird, and I think it would make it. Well, I made it through the window and we went into the other room. The kids still didn't wake up, but by then that was fine because we went in and we had a talk together. So that was our first day. It's a made to remember. And uh, the other thing I'll share when you talk about Warren's quirky thinking, I know how I happened to go to the introduction service because I was going through counseling. And the person who suggested the service, um, he told me he didn't think I'd been scientific enough for my first choice. I don't know about that. But anyway, that's how I went to the introduction service, because he knew how it was being set up and it was legitimate. Warren told me, he didn't remember how he signed up, but he told me that he had signed up for the dating introduction service because he wasn't going to be able to play sports for several months. So he thought he'd chase girls. <laughs> Tell me about a man who thinks that way that he's going to chase girls with a cast of his grand. Thank you.
several places, including uh, Minnesota. We take a moment and we think of ancient words that have been said over so many people's bodies when they wore out. Earth to earth and ashes to ashes and dust to dust. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, says the Spirit, for now they rest from their labors and their good works do follow them. We'll now have the pipes announcing it's time to get on with our living. 